guys here. Uh, we are so happy that you got up this morning healthy, um, or even if you're unhealthy, but you still decided to come. You know that this day is a special day that God created for us to get rest, um, to get rejuvenated, to um, also, I think, fill us with peace and fill us with joy. Um, and one of the things that I realized, we were away for um, the last couple of weeks, but last week we were at a... Um, at a camp meeting in Tennessee, and I was talking to someone there, and I realized um, through the talks, I was just talking about some struggles, I realized that I've been, I think personally, I've been at this point of like having low joy in my life, and I, I don't know, I don't know why, but at least this person helped me to realize that, and he pointed me to this verse that I wanted to share with you. Um, it's in Psalm 1611, which is our invitation to worship. And he says, uh, um, David writes here, You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, <clears throat> with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And so this person reminded me, we are filled with joy just being in God's presence without having to do anything, be anyone. Um, we don't have to do anything to, for God to have uh, joy with us being in his presence. He gives us joy um, from, from that. And so I also think that, you know, every time we come together to worship together here, um, we are obviously reminded of um, whether it's Bible verses, whether it's through prayer you're touched, whether it's through the message, through songs. Um, but I think that this is a special time um, in case you're low on joy that, you know, it's a good time to have just being in God's presence here all together and us worshiping and praising God together, that he fills us with joy. Um, so I pray and I, I ask God to give that to you all today as we are here together. Um, and with that, I, um, I want to let, let's start to worship God through music. And our first song that we are singing is a very amazing, strong powerful song and it's revelation song and the lyrics say uh, worthy is the lamb who was slain holy 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 is the lord god almighty um, he is our everything and we will adore him and so um, with this um, opening song i ask all of you sing with your full hearts
worship God through prayer collectively, and I want to ask uh, Jesus if you can come up and uh, lead us in that. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Uh, today we face a lot of adversities, you know. Uh, you look at life, and it comes at you on a blind side at times, and we find ourselves wondering, you know, how can I get through this? You know, and I, I think about, you know, uh, the blessing that God is in my life and in my church members' families' lives. You know, uh, you all heard about Pastor Quentin and his daughter being involved in, or sh her, her being involved in an accident. And, uh, you know, the devil wants things for bad, but glory be to God that, you know, even though her car was told and she was a little banged up, she's well. You know, I mean, God is evident today. Donna's here banded and wounded, you know, but she's here, you know, a little, like I said, the, the devil can break bones, but God keeps the spirit well, you know, and you're here today, and I, and I thank you to see you here today, standing valiantly here, or sitting, <laughs> and um, I just want to thank God for being here, and those of us that are, you know, willing to come out, you know, and show our devotion towards a brotherly hood, and coming together in union as family and members in Christ, so as today, you know, I also ask that we all bow our heads so we can have a moment of prayer. Oh, kind and merciful Father, we thank you that you invite us to come as a family and that we will receive the mercy of thy son. We thank you that he is the veil that shields us, dear Lord, from our iniquities and our transgressions and our sins, that we can make ourselves present to you through him. 
through his sacrifice and his love. We ask you, dear Lord, to be with all our family members. You know each and every one of us who have our struggles and our tribulations. You know what we are going through. Um, we live in a worldly time, dear Lord, that uh, we find ourselves, in a sense, swayed-minded, dear Lord. But we thank you, dear Lord, and in that you still call us. Give us ear to hear that we be submissive and obedient, that we would hear the call in the trialing and troubling times. I ask for a special blessing on my Ukrainian brothers and sisters, that which is happening in Ukraine and throughout the other parts of the world, dear Lord. Uh, you know, the effects that is happening here, dear Lord, we see the the prices of things happening, and some of the family members can't afford the, uh, what's happening here, dear Lord. But you are evident in all our lives that even though we are crying, we're not without. I also ask today, dear Lord, it's an honor, dear Lord, that I could stand here and, you know, I don't want to say introduce my son because you all know him, but I, I, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to share this same platform. And I thank you that you would elevate him, his words, that they be your words and not his own, that you will endow the Holy Spirit on his lips, on his heart, on his mind, and his soul, that when he opens up, dear Lord, that he reaches every deaf ear, every troubled heart, every troubled mind, and that there will be a peace, that there will be a stillness in within each and every one of us, dear Lord, as we receive the message from Manny, that uh, we leave here not so much as just feeling good about ourselves, but knowing that there is a change and each and every one of us that needs to be made, and that we would make that election, dear Lord, that call that you call upon us, that we say, here I am, that we have a forgiving heart towards one another, that we move forward, and that we grow in unity and love in, in your mercy and in your grace, dear Lord. We thank you for everything that you have given us and continue to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Jesus. Well, our... Our next song is called The Battle Belongs, and I don't think there could have been a better introduction to it than what Jesus just prayed for. The battle belongs to the Lord on our knees. Um, it, that's where it starts, and, and that's the part that we do, and God does the rest. And so um, with that, let's sing together, The Battle Belongs.
and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our you shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. God through giving, and today uh, our loose offering is for Camp Mohaven specifically. Um, while, while as we as we um, do the giving, uh, I want to also do a little spotlight on Camp Mohaven. Um, and there's a video about the damage that happened about a month or two ago, and so you can see directly about uh, what happened as well as the impact that the um, our tithes and offerings today will be. Um, having on Camel Haven. So if you could please play that. My name is LJ Robinson, and I'm the boys director here at Camel Haven. That night, I was actually watching the NBA Finals um, with a couple of the guys. And after the game was over, I was walking back to where I was staying in Oak, actually, uh, right back there. Um, that's where I was stay. A few minutes after I got in there, um, I got a alert on my phone, um, and I saw that it said there's a tornado warning. I'm Callian. I'm a counselor here, and I am nature director. I'm Natalie. I'm also a counselor here, and I work archery. I woke up to what I thought was like an amber alert sound because my phone was right there so that it wouldn't disturb the kids. And then I looked at it and I just read tornado. And like it took me a second to process it. My name is Sophia Shrodell. I am currently in SIT at Camp Mohaven. Last Monday night was a crazy night, nothing that I've ever experienced before. It was the second night at Cub Camp. My co-counselor was down there with me and we were waking up all the girls, throwing their shoes on. Went down the hallway and woke up um, the nurse and the pastor that were here. And we went downstairs and within a span of like five minutes or so, the storm got pretty bad. When I got there initially, it wasn't raining at all. And by the time we got downstairs, like it was heavy rain, really bad wind. My name is Charles Ames. I'm a canoe director. I'm a counselor and a lifeguard. The night of the storm, I was in my cabin, cabin two, and I was in my bed. The, the G staff comes bursting through the door and they're like, we gotta go, we gotta go. And then as soon as I get outside and I see it's completely, not, it's not what I saw a couple minutes ago. There's lightning everywhere, the trees are like sideways. And all of a sudden they're like, there's a tornado, like we gotta go, we gotta get to our safe spot. So we get in a line, my co-counselor Emma, she's in front, I'm in the middle, and we just book it towards Oak Lodge. 50 feet from the cabin, one of my campers fall. And as soon as that camper is picked up, 
and moved, a branch falls exactly where she was. She lost her shoe and tried to go back for it, but we told her, no, just keep going. I get my camper, I wake him up, I'm like, it's just a little storm, just a little storm. I get his shoes on, one of the G-staff takes him. There was this one time we were running, and as soon as we shone the light, there was a tree right in front of us with a power line. We almost ran into that. Then I run to the bottom of the pool bathhouse, which is where the boys go for a tornado shelter. I came out of my cabin and look at the tree that had almost hit my bed, and that was scary. We run a little bit farther, and my shoe comes off, so now I have one shoe, and I'm scared of the tree. All you can think is, how many girls do I have? Are they all okay? Making sure they're all safe. The tree that fell on Oak, that night when we went out um, with Pastor Red and the other guys, we could kind of see the tree had landed on the building and also on a car as well, and the entire roof was just crunched in. Thankfully, no one got injured. And honestly, we kind of felt as if in some sense, the devil was kind of attacking the pastor for that week. We're very thankful that she and her kids were okay. Even with all the damage that happened, whether you know in Girls Village or in the woods or on cars, thankfully, no one was injured in the whole storm, which was a, in all honesty a miracle considering how much trees and damage there was outside when we woke up the next morning. Like God's hands were in all of this. Yes, Satan was really trying to keep these cub campers from learning about Jesus, but God, he was pushing the trees away from all the buildings. This bench, a tree fell an inch away from it between this bench and the cabin over there. So just an inch to spare. He, like God just barely pushed it so nothing got damaged. I feel like nobody was hurt because, honestly, I would say it was because of the Holy Spirit and God, because there was so many incidences where they were right by a tree and it didn't fall. A branch didn't fall, not even a small twig. And then as soon as they leave, it falls. You have heard a few stories of God's protection here at Camp Mohaven as the storm rolled through. Truly, we have experienced that God was with us in the midst of the storm. He has protected campers and counselors. And now we invite you to join with us in the rebuilding. Thank you for your donations, for continuing to remember us in prayer. In your churches, the next few weeks, we are collecting a special offering. You can mark your envelopes, the Camp Mohaven Storm Recovery Fund, or you may go to the Adventist Giving app, or those nationally, you may also go to our website, ohioadventist.org. Thank you again for your support, prayers, and your financial help. If you would like to give um, to the Camel Haven Storm Recovery Fund, um, please, you can, uh, you can give here in the place or you can also go online. And um, we appreciate the support and the prayers for our campgrounds for the kids and families that go there every year. And so now let's pray for, um, for the tithes and offerings that were given. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for um, emptying, having us to give back and um, also implement this principle that you give us about giving back and always um, thinking about others and being more, more selfless in our day-to-day, -day. Um, and that also includes financially. And we also, we ask that you take these funds and use them in the most appropriate ways um, that you know will um, be best for your, for your people, um, for the gospel. In your name we pray, amen. Our scripture reading for today is going to be found in 1 Samuel, and I'd like to ask Sylvester to come up and read it for us. Good morning, church family. Just give me a second. Oh, I guess it's right there on the screen. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. 
Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Thank you. We look forward to hearing what happens at the end of that story. <laughs> um, and our, our last song that we're going to sing before, the, before hearing the message is Here I Am to Worship. So for this song, please stand up, and we want to hear you up here, sing with all of your hearts. Here we are all together to worship our God. You did. 
may be seated. We, all ha we have Children's Church today meeting in the church basement, and our topic is dip in the water with our teacher, Chris. So kids, if you want to make your way over now to the, um, to the uh, school basement, um, usually for, this is for kids about 10 and under, um, and I'd like to introduce Manny to come up so we can worship God through his message with your message called Facing Our Giants. Love, love here that word, man. Pastor always said that the, the worship, uh, as far as the songs and praise, is his sermon. Amen. Uh, I love it. I love it. Well, before we get. Uh, see here. Should I take it out? Hold that for me. It's got there. <laughs> Let's put it in my pocket. So it works a little bit better. Does that work? No? I can use the mic. I can use the mic. That's fine. That's the giants, ain't it? That's the giants. When God is in the place, and you see Satan scheming, doesn't he? He likes to scheme. I was getting ready for the sermon, and as I was getting ready for the sermon, I was talking to my son Elijah. I said, Elijah, son, what should I preach about? You know, he just loves the Lord. I mean, this young man loves the Lord, and he says, well, Pops, what about Nehemiah? I said, well, son, I just did Nehemiah. He said, but it's still good. <laughs> And he said, well, I said, give me another one. And he says, Dad, what about David and Goliath? And I started to think about this. I said, son, you want to talk about David and Goliath? And before we get into it, because I, I know that some of us are going through these storms or facing these giants, but I want you to know that God is bigger than those giants. Amen? And, and I want you to know that when you get rioters block. He sends a little four-year-old to tell you, just focus on those old good stories, amen? And I started to re-look at this story. Now, if you can, I would tell you guys to read the entire uh, story. And you're going to find that where? Does anyone know where the story is found in? Anyone? 1 Samuel chapter 17. I would tell you that I would expect for you as you leave, not just to take what I say, right, but what? The word of God says, and this is an incredible story because in 1 Samuel chapter 17, 1 through 54, you're going to get a ton of details about David and Goliath. And when I started thinking about David and Goliath and I started to think about his giant, what he was going through, I started to make those comparisons to our Goliaths, our giant. And so we're going to go through this journey because frequently we use these stories in uh, metaphorically uh, as we look at the problems that we're going through, uh, that they seem to be bigger than us. We would like to say that we're facing some giants. We're, we're going through something, but there's something that that giant has to face. And so go on that journey with me. Before we get started, just bow your heads really quick. Lord, Father. I ask that the Holy Spirit fill this place in a mighty way. I thank you for uh, my son, my daughter, my family, but I thank you for him to challenge me to think differently, to search for you a little bit more intentionally. Lord, I ask that you be with everyone that's here in a mighty way and that they are filled in such a way that they are changed. In Jesus' precious name, amen. David and Goliath now when we think about metaphorically the storms or the giants that we're going against, we need to understand that factually what David was going against was absolutely tangible. He was real. And I don't know if you've ever seen anything, but working at Best Buy, we have some stars that come in. Some of those basketball players like their technology, amen? And they would come in and you would have these guys who are six foot six, six foot seven, come in. 
and they look like giants. They're massive. I look up, massive, someone close to seven feet tall, and you look up, and they're just big. And yet they're dwarf compared to Goliath. Uh, Goliath, when you understand how big Goliath was, he was roughly nine feet, nine inches. I, I mean, my hand up, I still can't touch him. Massive man. It, it was said that the weight of his armor alone was over 125 to 145 pounds. Just his armor. It doesn't include the size of the spear or the shield that he carried. What's important for you, if you would open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 11. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 11. This man's mere presence, it did something to some people. This man's mere presence did something to these people. And here it goes. And when Saul and the Israelites heard those words of the Philistine, they were what? They were dismayed. Uh, they were what? They were dismayed and greatly afraid. When they seen him, I'm going to put my Bible over here real quick. When they seen him, they were shook. They, were, oh, oh, they, they felt like all the promises that God had given them. Whoa, 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 whoa. It stops here. We can't get past this giant. Now, I was listening to a, a, a guy, a, most of you may have heard him, Tony Evans. He talks about the story of a man who had gone to the hospital. He says, doctor, my shoulder hurts. He says, well, does it hurt here? He says, sir, it hurts everywhere. It hurts when you touch my head, it hurts. When you touch my shoulder, it hurts. When you touch my hip, it hurts. When you touch my knee, it hurts. And the doctor says, Everywhere? Everywhere hurts? He says, let me, let me see your hand. He said, come on, bro. It's not your whole body. Your finger's dislocated. It's just your finger. It's just the one thing that is messed up. It's not everything. Beloved, sometimes what you're going through in your life, there's only one thing, but it seems like it's messing up everything. There's just that one thing that if you could just overcome, it, it would make everything else a little bit more of a relief. And what I want you guys to know, and what I want you to have is the confidence to be able to look at your Goliath and understand that you too can overcome him. Amen? That you too can overcome him. Now, when I think about our Goliath, our Goliath doesn't carry a sword or a shield. No, no. It carries weapons like unemployment. Some of our Goliaths carry things like health problems. Some of our Goliaths are family problems, uh, stress, mental health, anxiety. Some of us are dealing with different type of Goliaths that we're trying to be supportive, but we're dealing with something that we just feel like we can't get over. Every one of us face a Goliath. You're not alone. And as we think about these things, I need you to understand that unfortunately, like Goliath, where he's prancing around, he's parading on the hills of Elah, they're a lot closer than the hills of Elah. There, there are Goliaths, some of them are at our offices, some of our Goliaths are in our home, some of them are even in the church. Beloved, do I dare say that even some of them can be in your bedroom, right in your next to your spouse? The, the issues that it brings is bills that cannot be paid, grades or scores that we cannot make, people that we cannot please, drinks that we cannot resist, passes that we cannot escape, futures that we cannot face. We know our Goliaths. Each one of you know your Goliath. We see his face. We know his voice. But is Goliath all that we see in here? Is that all that we see is the doom and gloom? Or, or, or can there be something to be said in the story? There's a story of a woman. Her name was Florence Chatwick. In 1952, she attempted to swim in the chilly ocean waters from Catalina Islands to the California shores. She was swimming, and as she was swimming, she was giving it her all. 
She was working hard, and she kept going 15 hours of swimming. 15 hours, and as she's been swimming, and as she is swimming, she's exhausted. She begins to say, I, 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 I got to quit. I just can't make it. She looks up, but when she looks to see it for the shoreline, she can see fog. She can't see her destination. And so her mom is in the boat telling her, just keep going. Just keep going. But eventually she gets so exhausted, she stops. They pull her in, the aides bring her onto the boat, and less than a couple minutes on that boat ride, the clouds or the fog cleared away. She was less than a half a mile away from completing her destination. The, just a half a mile, 15 hours you've been swimming, but just there, like they say, some people say it was like 300 yards. She had been swimming to reach this goal, but she couldn't make it. One of the guys interviewing her asked her, hey, what, what, what was going through your head? And she said, man, I was just so tired. I was so exhausted. I couldn't see through the fog, she explained to a news conference. I, I think that if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. If I could just see the destination, I know I could have made it. Beloved, if you could just get past your giants in your life, if you could just keep heaven bound, if you could hold to the promises of what Jesus Christ has laid, you can get to the promised land, amen? There are a giant that's in your way, and sometimes that's all we hear. But what I want you to do is I want you to look at David. I want you to see as David seen, hear as he heard. I want to challenge you to think a little differently. Now, as we look at this, David asked the men a question. David's a different type of breed. He sees all these people, 40 days this man has been parading and defiling God. 40 days this guy has just been saying, God, ah, you believe in a God? Come on. He's nothing. He doesn't have any power. And here what David says here is, David asks the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He speaks with power. He ain't scared. He, he speaks with authority. Now, I, I'll tell you, as you look at this, David shows up not to trash talk but to talk God. He's not here talking trash. He's talking facts. He's talking God. Everyone else, Saul and his soldiers, had completely forgot who they represented. You don't represent yourself, seven-day Adventist Christians. You represent the God Almighty. You, re you represent the great I Am, the creator of the world. When they see you, they should see his story. You are more than you anymore once you've been baptized by the water. Amen? You represent something more. That means we must live a little different, a little bit more. As we go through these things, David, you see these stories because it's profound. He, he sees something different. And I, I want to touch on it just a little bit. The first thing that he sees is that everyone's looking at this massive man. But what David looks at, he says, that dude's not circumcised. That dude's not circumcised. There's something different about that guy. That guy doesn't, that guy hasn't done the circumcision. There's something different. What's different about him? Well, on the eighth day, in the Israelite culture at that time, they would get circumcised. It was a covenant. What did I say it was? It was a covenant. What is a covenant? Does anyone know what a covenant is? A, a, a covenant was something super special. It was a divine ordained relationship or bond. It, it was a founded alliance or an agreement or a promise with God Almighty. He realized that when he seen David, he, David says, I, I got a relationship with God. I, I have what it takes to do whatever you think is impossible. But you, you don't have a relationship with the Almighty God, which means you don't have the goods, the strength, the power to overcome me 
by any means. And my son, we would like to, we like to uh, role play and we like to fight a little bit. And I happen to always be Goliath. He comes as David. He's taking his sword out and he's attacking me. And he attacks me ferociously. There's no mercy. And of course, he knows that there's something that happened to Goliath. That as he gets conquered, something happens. I'll talk about it later. But sure enough, there's no mercy. He takes me out. No fear. Beloved, have no fear. Attack your problems, not with your strength, because sometimes what you're going through is an impossible task that was designed for an impossible God. You were not meant to get credit for it. You were not meant to look good from it. You were meant to point people to Jesus. And so as we look at these things here, I love because David realizes this guy, one, isn't as big as he says he is. He, he, he's way too much talk. And, and so what we're going to talk about is simply, I know I can beat him. I know what God has put, put me through. I can handle this guy. There's no doubt in my mind. David shows up, and as he shows up, I want to give you a couple facts here because he's looking at something differently. He's looking for something differently. They're looking at how they can beat the Philistines, how they can take land, but David is looking at what? How he can lift and give glory to God. There, there's something different. There's a story of a boy who lost his lens. He lost his uh, uh, contact lens. He looked for 30 minutes because he knew his mom and dad were going to get angry if he couldn't find it. It was one of those real expensive lenses. You know, it costs a lot of money to buy those prescriptions. And as he looks for it, 30 minutes pass, he can't find it. Finally, he gets the courage. He goes in and says, Mom, where is it? I need your help. I can't find my contact lens. She goes in. She says, show me where you were at. He shows him where, she, where, where, where he was at. And sure enough, in less than two minutes, she finds it. He says, Mom. How did you find it so fast? She says, well, son, we were looking for two different things. You were looking for a contact lens. I was looking for $250. <laughs> you know, uh, we're looking for two different things. We're looking for two different things. What he was looking for, what the Saul was looking for, was something that was insignificant in comparison to what David's looking for. He's looking for something of great value. He's looking to praise the almighty God. And as he looks at these things, this is what David says. David says, when he confronts Goliath, he continues in the same vein, the same attitude. In verses 45 and 47, David says to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the army of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut your head off. Today I will give the carcasses of your Philistine armies to the birds of the air, the beasts of the earth. The whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All of those who gather will know, not that it is by sword and spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. And he speaks with authority and power. Beloved, if you are talking to people about the, about the name of Jesus, and you're talking about matter of fact, and you're not talking about the experiences that God has brought you through, what a shame. If you're not diving into the word of God and you're just giving opinions, you have a problem, beloved, but we can fix it. You need to study. You need to get on your knees and ask God, the Holy Spirit, to guide you. You need to fight your giants, not as Saul fought them. Oh, I'm afraid. I don't know. I don't know. But confidently go to your problems and say, I lay them down before God and that your will be done. Not that I be glorified, but that you be glorified, Lord. God focus versus giant focus. God focus versus giant focus. David sees what others don't or simply refuses to see what others do. I, I'm going to blind my eye to a lot of the nonsense, but I'm going to focus all my energy on what is God's will for me in my life. I'm going to focus on what God wants. It's not that he doesn't see the problem. David, it's not that he doesn't see the problem. He just sees God more than he sees the problem. 
And beloved, I know that you guys are going through a lot in your lives. I'm not telling you that there's not going to be problems. I'm just telling you that God is bigger than your problem. Amen? That God is bigger than your problem. And if you could see God in all his glory, in all the resources behind him, you will realize that David rushes to the problem. He doesn't run away from it. You have a confidence not to procrastinate, but to deal with it. You are going to have to deal with your problems, your giant. And I'm not saying, man, Manny, that sounds easier. You say it, that I, you know, maybe you can do it, maybe David could do it, but maybe I'm not like them. But aren't you? Think about it. How good was David? Was he a perfect man? Think about David. Despite his shortcomings, David was a man after God's own heart. But think about this. He fell as often as he stood. Beloved, you make mistakes. He made mistakes. Don't hold yourself to it. Hold yourself to a better standard. Now hold yourself to know that even though you are not worthy enough, that God is. And if you would just look here, you're going to stumble, but he also conquered. You can stumble, but you can also conquer. Uh, he, he, he stared down Goliath, but he made mistakes. He lusted over Bathsheba. Right? He, he, he could lead an army, but he couldn't manage his family. Beloved, he had many wives and, and he had many problems, but he had only one God. Beloved, you have to prioritize. Yes, life can get overwhelming. But one thing is for sure is that God is certain. And as long as you're willing to put him first, all those other problems become a lot smaller. You are never alone. You have never been alone. Our giants, ultimately, we have to face them or they will subdue you and they will overcome you. Right? You have to face them. We don't have to face them alone, though. We must focus first and foremost on God as it worked for David, it will work for you. Look back at the passage and see how David, look how he focuses. First, how much did he focus on Goliath? And I want to give you a couple times. He only mentions Goliath two times and not even by name. He only mentions the problem two times and doesn't even give him the credit of his name. And this is what he says in verse 26. David asks the man standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills the Philistines? That's the first time he mentions him. Meaning, I've already seen God deliver me once or twice, so I'm going to get my reward. Amen? <laughs> I've already seen God deliver me multiple times. I'm going to get my reward. It's a guarantee. It's a mindset. The second time he mentions Goliath, he says, your servant. Now he's talking to Saul. Everyone can't believe that David's going to be the one to kill Goliath. And so he's talking to Saul. And he says, your servant has killed both lions and bears. Uh, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like, no, uh, uh, be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Let me be very clear with you guys. He knows that he's going to win. He also knows that his testimony, what he's been through in the past, will deliver him again. Amen? I've beaten the lion, I've beaten the bear, and I'm going to beat the giant. Uh, beloved, there are some of you that have beaten financial issues. Some of you in here have beat uh, health issues. And, and, and some of us have beaten uh, family issues. And yet today there's a new giant in front of you and you're wondering, Lord, can I beat it? Yes, you can. Because God has delivered you all the way to the point of you being here today or you being online watching. And God will and has always delivered you. Your testimony is a powerful one if you would use it. If you would use it, David's not worried. There's no question about Goliath's age, his capacity, his intelligence. No concern about the type of weapon he's going to use, the weight of the spear, the size of his shield, uh, the strength of his armor. David doesn't care. Because he knows God will deliver him. Beloved, don't worry about what you're going through. Know for sure that God will deliver you. For sure that God will deliver you. So instead of focusing on all the giants, how many times did David focus on God? Well, let's just look here. 
God, on the other hand, he mentions no less than nine times. In verse 26 and 36, he says, the army of the living God. In 45, the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel. In 46, he says, the Lord will deliver you unto my hand that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. 47, the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord and he will give you unto my hands or unto our hands. God focuses outnumbered. Goliath focuses nine to two. It's a four and a half times difference. Now, why is that important? Do you think about God's grace four times more than you think about your guilt? Do you think about God's glory and presence and awe more than your circumstance and your situation four or five times more? I have people that say, man, I'm going through this. And I say, well, beloved, he brought you through this. He brought you through this. He brought you through this. Beloved, I'm not asking you to make a sandwich, a good sandwich where you say something good, something negative, something good again. No, no, no. I'm asking you to look at the abundance of God's grace for you, that you are up this very moment, which is a privilege that most people are taking for granted this very day. Not many people get to wake up and have food in a nice warm bed. Beloved, you are blessed tremendously four times before you complain about one is the challenge. When you look at your life four times, I want you to think, Lord, thank you for this. Four times before you think about the one complaint, that list of complaints, right? Four blessings that God has given you. And then think about that complaint. I can tell you, your complaints start to get real small because your attitude becomes very different. Your approach becomes very different. And now what I'm complaining about becomes an opportunity for me to praise God through a storm, to give him glory. See, as I think about these things, David teaches us something simple but powerful concept. If you focus on your giant, you will go down. But if you focus on God, your giant will go down. You must focus on God. Why do you must focus on God? Because he's a bad man. Why are you going to focus on God? Because he's powerful. Because he's the great I am. Because he loves you. Because he loves you. It says this in Isaiah 51, verses 15 and 16. But I am the Lord thy God that has divided the seas, whose waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in thy mouth. And I have covered thee with a shadow of my hand. That I may lay, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundation of the earth. And say to Zion. Thou art my people. Beloved, you are God's people. And when God says you are my people, that means you start becoming untouchable to a lot of the circumstances. Now, your body may go through pain, but your soul is eternal. Beloved, we're not in the business of saving this body because we're going to get a new one. Amen. We're in the business of saving your soul, your family members' souls, the people that you love souls. And so here, I want you to understand that if you are God's people, this is just a moment in time. If you are God's people, then you are going to praise God regardless of the circumstances that you're going through. Because you know that the end of the story is that you and me are going to go home. No more pain, no more suffering. And when I think about this, the people, the people that God has under his wing, we don't have to fear We don't have to fear about man. We don't have to fear about man-made things because he is God. He's all-powerful and all-creator. We are free uh, to to be able to express ourselves in a mighty way, not because of what I'm going through, but because I want to testify for what he has done so that other people can hold on to that promise and come to the promised land because God is our God. He is intimate with us. He protects us. And with his hand, because we belong to him in a unique relationship way, as his people, he is protecting you. I mean, God is powerful. There's a story of a guy. Let me put my note here real quick. There's a story of a man, uh, and this is in 1988, the Summer Olympics in South Korea. Ben Johnson of uh, Canada, he's running the 100-meter dash. He set a new Olympic record, a new world record. All the American, uh, our American uh, contenders, uh, 
uh, what's it called, uh, Carl Lewis. He came in second, and most people were shocked because they expected him to win gold. After the race was finished, the judges began to look into Johnson, and they realized that he was using illegal substance. And as he was using these illegal substances in his body, um, he basically got his medal taken away. Uh, even though he had ran faster, he had made an unforgettable impression. He did not deserve that reward. Now, while all this was happening, hours later in another race, it should have been finished a long time ago, there was a marathon. And the last marathon runner is finally getting to the stadium. Now, at this point, as he's running into the stadium, there's people that were talking about the drama of that day. There are people that are beginning to leave the stadium. And as they're leaving, they then see this guy who comes in, and he looks beat up. He, he's got bandages on him, and he's trying to get to the finish line. As he gets over there, they see that he has a bandage on his leg from a previous fall. Now, everyone's already leaving, but the little bit of the crowd that's there, they start to cheer him on. Go ahead, you can do it. And he goes through, and he finally crosses that line. He finally makes it. The, the guys come, and the news guys come around. They say, oh, why didn't you finish the race? You were dead last. Most people, the, the second last person came in about an hour ago. Why did you keep going all beat up? And he says something that was super profound. He says, my countrymen send me 7,000 miles not to start a race. They send me 7,000 miles to finish the race. Beloved, you are here not by chance. I'm not talking just church. God has put you in the right time, at the right moment, that you would be saved. You could have been born in the 60s or in the 1930s or all the way in the 16th century. You could have been born in any time in history. But God chose you at the right time at the right moment, to be right here, right now, that if you hadn't made a choice, that you could finish that race. The fog doesn't have to be there no more. The blinders are removed. The church is cheering you on. Heaven is waiting for you. Today is the day. Today is the day where you cross and you realize that when you cross, people say, why did you give your life to the Lord? Because it was never your life in the first place. It was God's the entire time. But he loved you enough to let you go. But he's waiting for you to come back home. See, your giant no longer is an excuse. Your giant is no longer an excuse because you're not alone. The church is waiting for you. Heaven is waiting for you. Jesus Christ has died on the cross for you. Goliath can come in many ways. They can be lickering on the, uh, on the internet, behind a bottle, sitting in the cubicle, sleeping in your bed. But you can conquer your Goliath, not with five stones, but with one. Not with five stones, but with one stone, only one stone. And that stone is Jesus Christ. See, Ephesians chapter 2 says is that, that stone is a cornerstone. That that stone is a cornerstone. And if you want to beat your giant, if you could just build upon that cornerstone, salvation is guaranteed. If you could just take a moment and realize what Jesus has done, he is there to lift you up, to support you, to carry you through the quick sign, to carry you through, to push you through that rushing wave, to get you through that crowd. If you would just trust in Christ alone, our hope is found. Our victory is guaranteed. All right, thanks so much, Manny, for that message. Um, and now, let's sing our closing song, In Christ Alone. Thanks for picking this one. It's one of my favorites.
And everyone, if you can stand up.
Oh, God is good, isn't he? Oh, God is good. If you could bow your heads with me. Lord, first, just, man, you are incredible. I ask that this place be filled and the Holy Spirit would be here and no question that it was. No question that you fill this place in a mighty way, Lord. But Lord, I ask today that we now throw that stone and take that Goliath out of our lives and that we move forward onto the other side of the valley and begin to grow the kingdom. There are roadblocks in our lives. Lord, I ask that you strengthen us so that we can destroy those roadblocks. But that on the other side, there's purpose. We're not just trying to get through the storm. We're trying to thrive. Lord, the Holy Spirit has been here, and I ask that it fills their homes, that it fills their work, that it fills every aspect of whatever our church members, our family, our friends, our visitors, they come, those that are listening, that they be filled in such a way people know there's a difference. Let's conquer these giants, Lord. And if they cannot do it on their own and they need help, Lord, I ask that they come to the elders, the pastor, and if not, the church members, so that we can get through this war together. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you, Manny. And thank you all for joining us today. We love to see all of you, and we invite all of you to come back next week at 11 um, for our next worship service. We have a couple announcements. We have a blood drive going on in the gym, so anyone that still wants to go and donate blood, that's going on until 4 p.m., so feel free to make your way over. Um, and there's today also Lakewood City Meltdown Festival, which is a festival down in downtown Lakewood, which is pretty much from our street over east. And um, it's, it's quite fun to, to see. Um, but we're also doing a prayer tent outside um, from 4 to 7. So anyone that wants to join that, um, get in touch with Carolyn. That's today from 4 to 7. Um, and we're also doing two other prayer tents, August 6th and September 10th. So um, for any of those other festivals, if you want to um, join the prayer tent, let Carolyn know. Um, and just a little look ahead. Um, so next week we have Pastor Quentin here. And uh, we have a baptism day and a potluck. Um, so anyone that has feel called to be baptized, um, please get in touch with Manny or the pastor. Um, and um, also sign up to bring something for potluck next week. On July 30th, we have Elder Gladys Kreider preaching. August 6th, we have Syl Sylvester Smith. August 13th, Pastor Q. And August 20th, again, um, Elder Manny from today. And um, final announcement is uh, we are going on a church camping trip from September 23rd to the 25th. Church will be closed that day. Um, and we would love every single person to be able to go to that so we could um, spend time together, worship God together, have good conversations around campfire um, outside of the church. So um, register now on our church website and um, transportation will be provided on Sabbath for those who cannot attend. And you can also use the QR code to register right there. All you do is you turn your camera app on and you scan that uh, square. And that's it. So thanks so much for joining us today, and we hope you have a beautiful day, blessed Sabbath, um, full of rest, peace, and love.